Great. Um, then I'll just step, take a step back from Switzerland and take us over to Austria. And it comes as no surprise, I think, given that Rich has just said what, I'm, um, what I've been researching for my PhD. So um, I come through. I come to my to the text that I'm looking at um, from that consumer and surface and aesthetic angle a little bit. So I'm trying to give you a little bit of a background first before we get properly in the into the nitty gritty of the text itself. What I've been um, looking at here is um, the way Austria is often portrayed, which is the backbone of what I'm about to say. So it's often um, perceived as a museum of Habsburg grandeur, as a culture nation. And as a nature reserve and tourist haven, these are foundational narratives of Austrian self-stylization, and they are particularly prevalent in tourism marketing. And there are um, tons of um, theorists that have taken that on in their critique of Austrian culture and literature, from um, cultural historians like Anthony Boucher through historian Oliver Radkolb or public intellectual um, Robert Menasse. The focus here in this paper then lies on the latter. So the self-stylization is a nature reserve and tourist haven which puts the alpine landscape and its allegedly pristine nature center stage. As some of the previous speakers from not only today, but also obviously the other two days, have already touched upon, that notion of a pristine nature must be called into question for a multitude of reasons. Now, especially in the light of Anthropocene narratives and approaching the issue from the angle of eco-criticism. Earl um, Ellis and other Anthropocene critics have even um, spoken of the pristine myth, which basically calls into question whether there can be anything as, as pristine nature at all, not, over, not only in the Austrian or the Alpine case. However, it is precisely that myth that still is a foundation um, for Austrian self-stylization for her identity and the national brand. So the national brand, as I understand it, and, and I've, dis I've decided to kind of um, conceptualize it, is an image of Austria that is constructed through processes of consumer culture. And these can range from deliberate um, marketing efforts through public and literary discourse. So the book that I'm looking at and a few examples of how tourism advertising works also play into this. So I've got, uh, I've picked two um, posters from recent tourism ad campaigns for you to look at here. The um, top left one is from 2013 and the bottom um, right one is from 2016. And here you can see the external use of this imagery of pristine nature in the Alps that's often used in tourism advertising. We have these very small visitor groups that are in an apparently untouched landscape, which is, I think, particularly clear in the top left um, picture with the people walking through the snow, but there's only one set of traces. Everything else is completely virgin and untouched. And it's also underpinned by the advertising text that we see in the other picture, that nothing can spoil this few perfection, which we all know is very questionable in, this, in, this, in our day and age. It's... Um, it's, it's a kind of a portrayal that um, lies at the surface of what Mitterer in the Piefke saga that Caroline spoke about um, two days ago is also unveiling and picking apart. What's quite interesting here as well is that the only human structure that we can see are these wooden huts, these Almhütten, which are accepted as a part of the landscape now, even though they are human made and thus not part of any pristine nature as we would like to see it. However, they blend in with their surroundings, offer shelter and coziness, and have become part of the established touristic, touristic image, of the, image of the alpine landscape because they are precisely the retreat that tourists long for. And this stylization of the Alps very much is um, a dream scenario, and Traum scenario, an Alp Traum in the positive sense. And it's not only limited to um, external audiences, as we can see in political campaigning, for example. So here, similarly, a positively charged image of nature and the alpine landscape is addressed, uh, is used and in, in addressed to an internal audience. For example, in um, Alexander van der Bellen's campaign poster from the 2016 Bundespräsidentenwahl, and um, a poster from one of his harsh political opponents, Herbert Kickel, from the 2019 Nationalratswahl. In both cases, the Alpine landscape is not only a backdrop and a romantic and, and elating scenery, it's also become a synonymous image that speaks for Österreich, very explicit in Van der Bellen's case, and for Heimat, which is in this case the same thing in Kickel's case. Both use this landscape as a signifier for Austria then, and maybe hope that they, the impression of the mountainscape rubs off on them a little bit. Um, and all these ads and posters that I've just shown in these two slides, it's just a very, very small fraction of what you can see here. 
rely on the positively charged portrayal of the Alpine landscape to get the message across. Ernst Harnisch calls this the goldenen Landschaftsmythos. This is um, a myth and a trope that it's known from genres such as the Heimat film, and it portrays the Austrian landscape. So not only exclusively the Alps, but this is what I'll be focusing on here for obvious reasons in a very positive light. It shapes the way both external and internal audiences perceive Austria to this day. And this myth has been a subject of debate despite its, uh, despite its prominence um, to, in the contemporary age as well. Particularly in Austrian um, tourism uh, marketing, we can still see that uh, the image of pristine nature and the Golden Landschafts mythos repeated time and time again, and yet it remains contested. Um, writers are among the core critics of this myth, as we can see, for example, in the genre of the anti heimat roman, or once again going back to Mitterer in the Piefke saga in a very obvious um, filmic format. What emerges then is a counter concept to the Golden Landschafts mythos which um, is termed a Schwarze Landschaftsmythos, which depicts a doomed and destroyed landscape, casting the Alps as a site of trauma rather than Traum. Um, as Harnisch then goes on to argue, die Landschaft bleibt immer ein Medium, um Österreich, die österreichische Mentalität zu charakterisieren und zu erklären. And a particularly striking example of a novel that portrays the Alpine landscape as a contested space rather than a romantic scenery, and that often um, makes the Alpine space a site of exploitation and trauma is Edelbauer's Das Flüssige Land. In her dystopian text, she uses the Alpine landscape in a way that underpins Harnisch's findings. It becomes a medium used to construct a paradoxical and exaggerated and polemical image of the Austria that lurks behind the beautiful facade of the Goldene Landschaftsmythos. Rafaela Edelbauer is a, a very young author. I'm, I'm just going to introduce her real quick because I don't know how many of you are familiar with her. Um, she was born in 1990 in Vienna and her career started like five, six years ago. And she was instantly met with critical acclaim. She was awarded the Raurisa Literaturpreis in 2018 and the Theodor Körner Preis for Literatur in 2019. The same year in which Das Flüssige Land, her debut novel, has been published and this too was met with critical acclaim, which meant consequently that it was shortlisted for both the German and the Austrian Book Prize and was widely publicized as well, of course. Um, in, a, in a very brief overview, the Flüssige Land um, deals with the story of Ruth, a young physicist who lives in Vienna, has just been offered an academic job and is about to start an academic career there, and who has to return to her parents' hometown to organize their funeral. She's received a call that they've both been killed in an unexpected car crash. And she kind of packs her things and, make, and gets on her way to their parents' home time to organize everything. The onset is, is already very strange because Groß Island does not appear on any maps. She tries to find it and cannot locate it at all. And then starts off on a whim, gets in her car and drives in the general direction she perceives the town to be and somehow manages to arrive there in a very weird, trippy kind of journey. Eventually, she stays in Groß Einland rather than just remaining there for a few days to get everything sorted. And as she settles in, begins to investigate the city's history. She realizes that something is wrong there, even though the town at the first glance appears pristine and wonderful and lovely like a postcard idyll. And she soon finds out that it's actually undermined by a literal hole, getting larger and larger and threatening to collapse and swallow the city in its entirety. Is investigating the city um, is also investigating Austrian history. And um, I find it quite interesting in parallel to um, Christian Kracht's novel, or you have to read them parallel to each other, I think, um, that digging in the landscape to have stuff, um, to, to keep stuff hidden is a very um, prominent trope here too. She tries then to um, develop a filler material that can help stabilize the town and save its mere like physical existence by filling that hole. And that filler material is eventually suppo is supposed to be applied in a very exaggerated and very polemical spectacle staged for tourists that might even put Mitterer to shame. Um, the Alps are very literally then a site of exploitation and catastrophe, and not only since the rise of mass tourism. This is what comes to the fore during her research of the whole's history. That is a result of silver mining, of lime extraction, so exploitation of natural resources, and also was the site of slave labor in the Nazi era, 
and it's described as Außenlage of Mauthausen concentration camp, where Jewish forced laborers have been put to work to um, help in the armament factory. The inhabitants of Groß Einland very much are aware that there is that lurking um, past festering underneath their feet and threatening to swallow them. However, they are concerned with fixing the appearance of the town rather than addressing the real issue, the whole itself. Avoiding to deal with the whole then means refusing to cope with the trauma of the Austrian past and the nation's guilt and its involvement in the Nazi atrocities in particular. Throughout the text then, and thus in a Ruth's experience because everything is written through her lens, the Alpine landscape emerges as a paradoxical entity that oscillates between extremes, between being exhilarating and positive on the side of relaxation and threatening and repulsive. This already starts when Ruth first arrives in Groß Einland. On her way there, she, a typical city dweller, is first of all overwhelmed by the Alpine landscape that she is not used to at all. In tune with the novel's title, the mountainscape appears to liquefy and Ruth makes an experience that is far from typical for the Alpine landscape. She feels as if she were in a vessel on a raging sea and is threatened to sink. Die Alpine, die umgeben wurde, desto feindgliedriger zogen sich die Wogen in die schroffen Gesteine, die abschüssigen Wege, die nun noch raueren Wälder. Und ich war nicht weniger davon ergriffen als die Natur. Etwas, das mich bisher in der Welt gehalten hatte, war aus den Angel gedreht worden. Das ganze Land stieg unter mir auf. Ich befuhr die Wellenzüge einer flüssigen Masse. Meine Hände zitterten in ihrem Griff um das Lenkrad und die Kontraktionen meines angespannten Körpers machten das Auto gefährlich schlingen. Ich musste mich dem Zugriff des Landes entziehen. Und dass in diesem Moment ein Rastplatz angekündigt wurde, war ein Wink des Himmels. So here we already see that the touristic imagery is turned on its head. The Alps are uncanny and intimidating and they are ugly. And the fascinating thing is that in a very disgusting, dirty slab of concrete that um, rest stop there, that would otherwise be perceived as an, as an abomination amidst the greenery, becomes a safe haven for all, a sign of, um, of, of civilization and of retreat and security. This, however, is not the only way she's, uh, she's gripped by the landscape then. The terrifying experience does not persist. As Ruth settles in in Groß Einland and takes up a job there, she begins to use the Alpine landscape in the way intended by tourism marketing. Gegen 18 Uhr beendete ich stets die Arbeit und brach, ausgerungen aber glücklich, zwei Spaziergang in den Wäldern auf, in die ich mich Tag für Tag mehr verliebte. Ich saß auf ausgebrochenen Baumstämmen und schaute mit leerem Kopf in die nebligen Täler, grub das Moos mit den Händen aus und suchte den schwarzen Erdkrusten nach Gerüchen und versteckten Lebewesen. Mit was für einer Macht die Landschaftsbildung in diesen Gebirgen fortgeschritten war, riss mich mit. So here, the, she exactly mirrors a scene from a tourism video app that was aired in 2013, which I would have shown you if we had the conference in person, but I think Zoom does not manage to um, display that amount of data. So if anybody wants to see that, um, just drop me a message later and I'll email it to you. I've got an um, MP4 copy of it. It's basically um, showing a, a stressed female city dweller like in her very cold and, and uh, minimalistic flat on a treadmill the only sound that you can hear is the sound of the motor of the mill and um, her partner is typing in the background sitting on the couch. She cannot sleep, she cannot unwind, she cannot relax. So the very next day they get in their car, a BMW X1 SUV no less <laughs> with a Frankfurt number plate and get on their way to Austria. The woman already begins to unwind then on the way driving through a subalpine um, hilly landscape. She, she stretches her hand out of the window and plays with the wind and starts to slowly calm down. And the longer they stay, just like wood, the more they grow detached from their life in the city. Their gadgets from phones through to fitness trackers disappear from view. They begin to dress differently and they begin to experience nature differently. During a walk through a forest with an Austrian guide, the woman steps very close to a piece of Adam lichen or moss that's hanging from a tree. And she carefully touches and caresses it and leans in very close to take in that earthly smell of, of, of that green piece of moss. So like Ruth here, the woman in the ad is touched and swept away by nature. The ad then ends with a, um, with a, style, with a style very in tune, um, very in tune with the um, Goldene Landschaftsmythos. It's a beauty shot of the mountainscape, the woman standing right in the middle, arms outstretched, and then in a pose that's very reminiscent of um, the sound of music, to be quite frank. 
looking up into the sky and then the Austria arrives and revives Logan the Pierce. Hood's experience, however, is intensifying beyond that point and she develops an addiction of sorts, if you can speak of that. Ich, die immer eine leidenschaftliche Städterin gewesen war, wurde nun beinahe ängstlich, wenn ich länger als drei oder vier Stunden in geschlossenen Räumen verbrachte. Ich begann dann alle fünf Minuten aufzustehen und nach der Natur vor meinem Fenster zu sehen, sie wie ein, die sich wie ein Gespenst hinter den Häuserfronten verbarg. So the positive attitude towards her surroundings cannot persist after all. The landscape is endangered by the whole and thus the collapse and, and, and thus it's subject to the collapse and imminent destruction. There is also a very real possibility that she will at some point gaze out of her window and find that the nature she has grown to love is gone. So that constant urge to check in on it and see whether it's still there is a, has a very real reason. Who soon after then finds herself in a complex moral dilemma. She has managed to develop a, fill, a filler material that could be used to fill the hole and stabilize the town and its surroundings. Its application, however, would come at an enormous cost. Es dauerte nicht lange, bis ich Hauptproblematiken ausfindig gemacht hatte, die bei der Umsetzung zu befürchten waren. Erstens würde ich einen Gemisch aus Benzinbasis produzieren müssen, das das Land wenige Stunden nach der Einspritzung unfruchtbar werden ließ. Tote, die Flora mordende Kastratenerde. Das war ein moralisches Problem, dachte ich. These concerns that she has here on a very theoretical level, where she's just been starting to research on that film and material, turn out to be very, very real. She has mixed a batch of that material a little later and has applied it to her own garden and, and soon realized that it does indeed suffocate all plants, destroying the flora in the entire area the material is applied in. So consequently, applying that co-caption on the larger scale to save the town would thus be an absolute death sentence for the lush meadows and dense forests that shape the alpine landscape that she's grown accustomed to now. It would destroy the very backbone of the Goldene Landschaftsmythos and take the polemical portrayal we have seen in Mitterer's film, for example, or that's very dominant in the Anti-Heimat literatur, just another step further. Nothing but destruction in a dead landscape would remain. There is nothing underneath the surface anymore to look at. And consequently, while doing so, it does not only save and stabilize the town, it will also hide the history forever and make a proper dealing with it completely impossible because nobody can go down there anymore in history and, and research the whole history and kind of clear up Austria's involvement in all this atrocity. As this realization begins to sink in, Wood's view of nature undergoes yet another dramatic change. Following a wave pattern, alluding to the title of the novel again and also the book's cover, which is um, what you can see in the bottom um, line of the presentation, her excitement subsides and makes way for a much more negative view. Mit einem Mal offenbarten sich mein Blick in Tal die Ausmaße der Einsenkungen, die sich wechselbildartig neigten. Die Flächen waren in Stücke zerhackt, kleine Unnütze in die Form gezwungene Felder. Ein Riss ging rings um die Innenstadt, entstellend wie eine tiefe Narbe. Das Panorama widerte mich an und gleichzeitig, je mehr ich von ihm Abstand nahm, desto mehr rückte es nach wie ein indiskreter Mensch, den ich von einem ablassen will. Zum ersten Mal bedrückte mich die Landschaft, mehr noch ein Ekel überkam mich. The disgust root feels when looking at the landscape is inescapable. She cannot retreat when she tries to take a step back, the landscape seems to follow. What is then particularly striking here is that this experience, even though it is too a negative one, is not a mere repetition of the one she makes during her drive to Groß Einland. The portrayal of non-human nature and human intervention in it has changed completely. Initially, in the first um, um, quote that I read, it is the untouched landscape that causes fear and the human intervention, so that slab of concrete is a sign of civilization and safety and becomes a rescue device. Here it is the visible human interference that appears to cause those negative feelings. The landscape is zerhackt, it is scarred, it is planned and uh, dismantled in small little pieces like a mosaic. It's not what it has been before human intervention anymore. So it, has not, it can no longer uphold the pristine myth of um, the golden landschafts mythos. Shortly after this experience then, Ruth asks herself a question that is ubiquitous in contemporary Austria and also in a lot of literary texts. Ich habe die Natur hier geliebt. Und was ist durch dieses verdammte Füllmittel daraus geworden? Kann die Alternative vielleicht nur sein, dass es entweder gar keine Landschaft gibt oder eine Tote? Keine Heimat oder eine Verrottende? In Edelbauers Vision, then, 
the alpine landscape as a contested sphere and much more than a romantic scenery. Rather than upholding a golden Landschaftsmythos, Edelbauer shows how trauma, a suppressed past, and the Austrian urge to please its visitors are eroding the landscape and avoid a sincere dealing with her past. Saving Groß Einland and saving the image thus means destroying the landscape. There is a lot more to say about how that question is raised and what Edelbauer does in, in constructing and possible answers to it that I cannot possibly address in this, uh, in this time frame, but I'd be happy to address that in the questions or maybe if anybody wants to chat to me afterwards as well, you have my email address, so feel free to send me an email. Thank you. Okay. Um, my presentation is quite visual. It's mainly uh, images, so you've got plenty to look at while I'm talking. So this afternoon I'm going to be discussing the career of Paul Heuss. Um, we have his dates there, 1886 to 1913. And he was one of the most brilliant young European climbers of the early 20th century. And he was also one of the most insightful writers about mountains and mountaineering of his day. My paper proceeds from, the, um, from Heuss's legacy in terms of his conceptualization of climbing Sorry, let me just let me just start the presentation properly. I don't think it's let me there we go. There we go. Yeah, sorry. So my paper proceeds from Poise's legacy in terms of his conceptualization of climbing as a practice led by a set of ideals which sports historians, most recently David Smart, the author of a first English language biography of Preuss, usually see as the birth of free climbing. But there's a broader interest and relevance to Preuss in his championing of a transnational vision of both the Alps and alpinism in the theoretical and practical questions he asks about sport and our attitudes to risk and in the ethical and ec ecological concerns implicit in his critical view of the impact of leisure activities upon the mountains. Preuss was born and grew up in Altaussee in Styria, close to the mountains of the Salzkammergut in Upper Austria, the son of middle-class secular Jewish parents. Always attracted by the outdoors and the natural world, he became a committed rock climber during his time as a student of botany in Vienna first and then in Munich. He came of age during a time in which alpine sports and leisure activities were, bo were booming, embraced by an increasingly diverse range of people, both men and women. And the Alps themselves were being discovered and developed as popular destinations for tourism, recreation and health. Alpinism, alpinismus, encompassing both mountaineering, the scaling of mountains in order to reach the peak or by a particular route, and sports climbing as an end in and of itself was in fashion. Pois was one of a close-knit generation of climbers from across the Alpine states, including figures such as Hans Dulfer, originally from North Germany, and the Italian South Tyrolean Giovanni Tita Piaz, known as the Devil of the Dolomites, um, who were redefining um, its nature and its limits. Preuss's short career was concentrated and transnational. He tirelessly crisscrossed the Alps in order, uh, in order to explore his native ranges in the Salzkammergut and Tyrol, the Dolomites, the Julian Alps in Slovenia, and the Bavarian, French, and Swiss Alps. To give an example of the intensity of his climbing, uh, between June and October of 1911, Preuss reached 93 different summits, including first solo ascents of the notorious western face of the Totenkirche um, in the Tyrolean Kaisergebirge, and the Giulia di Brenta in the Dolomites. And that's this towering sort of finger of rock that you can see there. Now these two were both extreme climbs by any standard and Preuss free climbed them. That is, he did so without the aid of securing ropes. 
It was a purist approach to his discipline that inspired both respect and a degree of bafflement, even before he articulated it in a series of articles and essays between 1911 and 1912. Many of that pioneering generation were to die in the First World War, which also saw the instrumentalization, militarization, and nationalization of alpine climbing. But Preuss's death came sooner, in October 1913, from a fall while climbing alone in the Gozalkam in his home region. So before I explore idea, uh, Preuss's ideas a bit more, I'd like to reflect for a moment on where climbing is today. It's worth noting with legacy in mind that it has recently acquired something like mainstream status, both in terms of participation levels and culturally. I'll cite three pieces of circumstantial evidence for this. So later this year at the delayed Tokyo Olympics, that is if they do go ahead this summer, uh, climbing should finally make its debut as an Olympic sport, marking a significant change in its status. And there you have two of the stars of the sport, the current world champions, probably favorites for the gold medals. It will feature a combined uh, competition uh, with three different disciplines, speed climbing, bouldering, and lead climbing. A second cultural indicator might be the Oscar-winning success of the 2018 documentary Free Solo, directed by Elizabeth Chai Basahelyi and Jimmy Chin, which records the American climber Alex Honnold's solo free ascent of El Capitan, the legendary towering cliff wall in Yosemite, California. And thirdly, we might observe that mountain tourism dating in the Alpine nations to the 19th century has seen continued and steady expansion and technological innovation with once remote and inaccessible regions being opened up to tourism. And parallel to that, climbing itself has become more accessible through equipment and infrastructure, as well as through improved knowledge and skills. The summit of Mount Everest, not long ago, the non plus ultra of difficult objectives has now been reached by well over 4,000 different people, perhaps even more than 5,000 now. I was, couldn't quite find the latest figure, but a huge number of people. So climbing is popular. Yet at the same time, it's an activity that's pulling in radically different, different directions. Sports climbing today is a pure test of skill and strength with the risk to life and limb essentially eliminated. In the speed and lead disciplines, climbers are secured by ropes. In bouldering, falls are routine and broken by padded mats. Alex Honnold's achievement, by contrast, could not be more different. In climbing a thousand meter near vertical cliff without ropes or any other form of failsafe, a fall would of course have been fatal. Honnold's is an extreme version of climbing, unthinkably terrifying to the majority. For some, his climb was a landmark human achievement. That's the, the, the quotation on the, uh, the, the film poster, you know, one of the great athletic achievements of humanity and an inspiring example of the attainment of goals. For others, it was a self-indulgent example of recklessness and a dangerous precedent. Honnold likes to point out that few activities are without risk, and he's critical of the reduction of climbing to a predictable form of sightseeing. Recent photographs of queues of gu guided parties of climbers near the summit of Mount Everest are a case in point. The fact that such tourists, for that's what they surely are, are at extreme personal risk in such traffic jams above 8,000 meters is one concern that they are also having a considerable environmental impact is another, just as they are upon every mountain environment whose summit has been made accessible. The construction of a viewing platform at the peak of the Zugspitze, Germany's highest peak, is another example. No climbing or risk are involved for the some 625,000 annual visitors, but of course there's considerable infrastructure and environmental damage. To criticize such initiatives is tricky because public access to the countryside, once a privilege of the wealthy, has been hard won and is worth defending. 
But needless to say, the touristification of mountains in this way is neither sustainable nor, according to many, ethically justifiable. Many of these discussion points are anticipated in Paul Poise's ideas outlined in his 1911 articles. The resultant debate is remembered as the Mauerhakenstreit, the Piton debate. Now, by the early 1910s, Preuss was an established commentator and speaker on Alpine topics and a prominent member of the German and Austrian Alpenverein. Um, it was in the Deutsche Alpenzeitung in August 1911, there you have a few uh, of his photographs, um, he was also an active photographer. Uh, it was in the Deutsche Alpenzeitung in August 1911 that he initiated this so-called Mauerhakenstreit. Preuss's essay, Künstliche Hilfsmittel auf Hochtouren, critiques the tendency to sportify alpine climbing by applying all available technology to make it standardized and safe. His objections centered on the use of Mauerhaken or Pitons, these were, these were and are steel wedges, usually with a hook, loop, eye or ring that climbers hammer into a crack in the rock face in order to secure a rope and in which, which in Preuss's day were usually left in place. And I think we see an example of one in the, on the north face of the Eiger in, in, the, um, in the clip from the film that we saw there. This was, and sometimes still is done, primarily for safety, as a fail-safe, to allow a climber to continue with a climb with the knowledge that they are roped to a piton. But it was not unheard of for climbers to climb up ropes secured to pitons or to use the pitons themselves as hand or footholds. And it was even more common for ropes to be used to upsail down from the top once an ascent had been completed. Preuss voices a fundamental objection to the idea of using any artificial aid to complete a climb. Yet he also rejects the routine use of pitons and ropes for safety and upsailing. The second quotation there. Auch der, auch der Mauerhaken ist ein Notbehelf, ein Mittel, Berge zu bezwingen, darf er nicht sein. In other words, he allowed for the carrying of pitons and ropes for use in an emergency, but not as part of a plan to complete a particular climb. In other words, the method that we see being used by Hintersteitz and Kurz to uh, ascend the, the, uh, the Eiger Nordwand would not have been acceptable to Paul Preuss because they are relying on the rope, swinging on that rope to make that quergang. And it was this latter point that triggered controversy. The most skilled of his contemporaries were happy to reject the use of artificial aids as the primary means of climbing. It would be like you know, putting a ladder up and climbing up a ladder rather than actually climbing um, in a sense. But they were reliant upon the use of pitons and ropes as a fallback, allowing the most difficult routes to be attempted. This, they argued, would simply not be possible in the absence of the securing presence of the rope. Preuss's views prompted counter arguments over the following months. The primary criticism aimed at Preuss was that his idealism was unethical in failing to distinguish between Gebrauch und Missbrauch of the pitons and ropes and would, would risk lives if put into practice. Piat defends their use both for safety and as a way of making climbing more accessible. Hätte der lächerlichste Gebrauch von Mauerhaken ein einziges Menschenleben gerettet, so wäre schon damit der Gebrauch gerechtfertigt. He continues, durch den versicherten Mauerhaken wollen wir uns nicht über Wände hinaufschwindeln. Wir wollen durch ihn nur die Gefahren, die uns drohen, möglichst reduzieren. Franz Nieberl is more aggressive in his response, calling Preuss der neu erstandene Puritaner der Felskletterei, representing what he calls ein kaltes, starres, frostiges Ideal. Preuss's response to the uh, criticism is still not well understood. He was certainly not arguing for a, a celebration of danger or for heroic fearlessness or for callousness. 
um, or for aggressively asserting one's will upon the mountain, discourses that were to feature prominently under National Socialism. His views are underpinned by a key principle that the individual climber should exercise caution and be willing to recognize his or her limits. He stresses that he's not arguing against all tourism and concedes that there's a place for the use of ropes to allow tourists a safe taste of mountaineering. But the climber, he argues, should never knowingly attempt a climb that is likely beyond his or her limits or abilities suggesting that this approach, which logically would mean that some climbs would remain impossible, would result in greater safety than would an over-reliance upon aids. The problem, he suggests, is that few really know their limits. Die Grenzen des eigenen Könnens sind für die meisten Kletterer heute unbestimmt, weil alle sich mit ihren künstlichen Hilfsmitteln Luftschlösser bauen. In December 1911, writing in response to Niebel, Preuss clarified his position through six core principles. And I won't read them all out, although I would note um, with, uh, with reference to, to what Evo was saying about, as, uh, about descents as well as ascents, that one of the things that Preuss was uh, insistent upon is that a climber should be able to climb down as well as up. That was by no means uh, automatically assumed or expected then or now. Um, but I would like to highlight the sixth principle in particular, which relates to safety. And he writes, Zu den höchsten Prinzipien gehört das Prinzip der Sicherheit, doch nicht die krampfhafte durch künstliche Hilfsmittel erreichte Korrektur eigener Unsicherheit, sondern jene primäre Sicherheit, die bei jedem Kletterer in der richtigen Einschätzung seines Könnens zu seinem Wollen beruhen soll. The latter point was quite a subtle one, perhaps counterintuitive. How can it be possible to remove safety precautions and still favor safety as a principle? The idea is that one's personal safety will emerge from self-knowledge. If a climber attempts only what he or she is able to comfortably manage, then the risk involved is reduced, if not entirely eliminated. In the same way, say that we might be confident in judging whether we can safely cross a road or not. In other words, safety and risk are relative. The logic anticipates that applied by Alex Honnold when pressed on the perceived extreme danger of his free climbs. Honnold, a teetotaler who lives an extremely frugal life, likes to point as a comparison to the widely ignored risks of sedentary, unhealthy lifestyles. And like Preuss, he's argued for the relativity of danger in regard to a given climb. He rarely undertakes a climb on site, as it's called, without preparation, that is and only attempted his El Capitan climb after meticulous study and practice lasting years, in fact. The climber and author Mark Sinnott, who has discussed the question of risk with Honnold, notes how the rationalization of the danger involved is a crucial step. He observes that according to the American Insurance Information Institute, a person born in 2013 stands a one in 24 chance of eventually dying in an accident. He writes, most of us look at our one in 24 chance of dying in some kind of accident the same way Alex looks at free soloing. We choose to go through life believing that we won't be unlucky because otherwise we'd be too afraid to get in our cars or even leave the house. If hanging from a fingertip jammed, jammed in a crack 1,000 feet off the ground is just as ordinary an experience for Alex as negotiating rush hour traffic is for the rest of us, then we, mon we might have to admit that his rationalization makes sense. For Preuss, aesthetics is clearly also a consideration that's inextricably bound to his understanding of safety. It's implicit in his criticism of the strained, kampfhaft attempt to ensure uh, safety. In his response to Piazzi's criticisms, he writes, schön klettern, in technischer wie ideeller Beziehung heißt gut klettern, gut klettern, sicher klettern. To rely on artificial aids by this reasoning is ugly and therefore inherently less safe. 
He notes elsewhere how many accidents happen despite all the pitons and ropes and so on. So in other words, you achieve safety through artistry. And it's in this context that his distinctive take, combining aesthetics, ethics and psychology, that Preuss's um, comments on the language of climbing and mountaineering are especially interesting. He notes that mountains, or particular climbs, are customarily received, conceived of in inimical terms. They are enemies to be fought and conquered. Jetzt werden die Berge gehasst, mit allen Mitteln bekämpft. Man wird sie wieder fürchten und lieben lernen. Undoubtedly, these thoughts have a relevance to the manner in which mountain expeditions, often referred to as campaigns or sieges, become proxies for nationalistic, imperialistic or ideological agendas. But Preuss's argument also has an ecological dimension. His criticism of the casting of mountains as enemies and the underpinning rationale that they should be engaged with in their natural form and not routinely modified to aid human beings anticipate the debates around the Anthropocene and man-made cl climate change. It's noteworthy that Preuss won his argument, at least in principle. Most of the discussants were eventually happy to concede the point once they had grasped that he was not arguing for recklessness, but rather the opposite. The idea that, quote, unfair means should be avoided was widely accepted. And it was hard to disagree with the notion that safety, always relative, should not be an absolute guarantee could never be an absolute guarantee, but something that should emerge from the selection of the route, from appropriate caution and a degree of self-understanding. Yet despite this, the history of the sport in the last century has tended in the opposite direction, with many of the things Preuss had criticised coming to the fore. On the one hand, technical innovation and the competitive urge to conquer through any means, on the other, the emergence of sports climbing and a desire to test speed and skill while eliminating risk. Following his death, the turbulence of the subsequent years of war and political transformation helped to erase the memory of Paul Preuss. His Jewish background also seems to have been a factor in the effective suppression of any sense of legacy within the German and Austrian Alpenverein an organization in which anti-Semitism came to the fore even before 1933, well before 1933, in fact, uh, and which, as Rainer Amstetter has shown in the post-war years, failed meaningfully to engage in a process of Vergangenheitsbewertigung. And this has changed only gradually. His legacy in climbing has been championed for some decades by Reinhold Messner, the first to climb Mount Everest without the artificial aid of supplemental oxygen, which he achieved in 1978, and whose 1968 polemical essay, Mord am Unmöglichen, was a conscious attempt to reinvigorate Preuss's ideas and apply them to the age of technological climbing. Messner objected to a culture which, because of the availability of technical aids, all doubt and uncertainty can be removed from climbing and nothing remains that is impossible. Seit das Unmögliche ausgelöscht ist, hat der Alpinismus seinen ursprünglichen Wert verloren. He makes a memorable mythological comparison. Das Unmögliche, der Drache ist tot und Siegfried ist arbeitslos geworden. Dieses Beispiel aus der deutschen Sagenwelt zitiere ich nicht, weil ich der Meinung bin, dass die Bergsteige Helden sein müssten, sondern weil der Mut in Menschen instinktiv nach dem nahezu Unmöglichen sucht, um sich daran versuchen zu können. Paul Preuss then seems to speak to current issues. In climbing through Messner's championing and through figures such as Alex Honnold, there's been a gradual move away from technical sieges of mountains towards an ethical approach to the sport known as clean climbing, first championed in the 50s and 60s by climbers such as the American Royal Robins, who eschewed pitons, bolts and other interventions in the environment and discouraged the reliance on large amounts of equipment. If we broaden our frame of reference, we see echoes of similar discourses in relation to other sports in which interpretations of fair means are contested. We might think of the recent impact of Nike's new footplate technology upon running, for example. 
Yet it's in Poise's promotion of a vision of climbing as adventure, as experience, and of an engagement with the natural world that leaves it intact, that we can see the strongest contemporary resonance. We see it in the recent growth in, of interest in challenge-based sport and leisure, not just mountain sports like climbing and hiking, but in wild swimming, fell running, ultra running, off-road cycling. His profound, potentially elitist skepticism about the unfettered exploitation of the alpine space for sport, and especially of its commercialized adaptation to accommodate the needs of ever more tourists, preoccupies some of the organizations tasked with the preservation and curation of the Alps, notably the International Commission for the Preservation of the Alps, CIPRA, which in 2016 demanded that the Winter Olympic Games, which it deems, quote, neither environmentally nor socially acceptable, should never again be hosted in the Alps. And in fact, they oppose them full stop. Paul Poyce would almost certainly concur and endorse Elfriede Jelinek's resistance voiced in the afterword to Indien Alpen to the reduction of the Alps into what she calls a Bergarena für Sport und Kulturindustrie. Auch die Natur selbst ist ja eine Art Sportgestell, ein Turngerät, das sich zur Benutzung präsentiert. Perhaps climbing, like skiing with its ski lifts and snow cannons, is guilty, is guilty of doing precisely this. But Poise's philosophy offers an alternative vision, albeit a problematic and uncomfortable one. As the price for, as the price for reigning in the nothing is impossible attitude will be a reduction in the number of human beings in and on the Alps. And as in 1911, there seems to be little appetite for that. Thank you.